Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our risen and ascended Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear Christian friends, you remember last week, last week where I had the sermon all written out, ready to go, ready to preach to God's people as they had gathered here into God's holy house, ready to hear the holy word of God, and then I kind of got off on a tangent about the Lord's Supper. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do too. I do too. I blame the Holy Spirit for that. But today, we're going to look at Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 3, as we should have done last week. We saved it for today. How appropriate and how apropos. The Lord moves in mysterious ways, doesn't he? Making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would mean a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see. Doesn't anybody recognize these words? Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. I told you I shouldn't sing today. And they're always glad you came. What a great description of the Christian church. You remember that? The little introduction song to the series Cheers. Remember that back in the 80s? We used to watch it every week. We loved it. We enjoyed it. Did you know, by the way, Woody Harrelson, one of the key players in that series, Woody Harrelson, is not only Lutheran, but Missouri Synod Lutheran. Did you know that? Just like you and me, he had to go through confirmation and he learned to say, what does this mean? And this is most certainly true. I dare say, if he was good in confirmation, he could do the very thing that you and I are going to do in just a few short minutes. Recite from memory the meaning to the third article of the Apostles' Creed. How many of you still have your little piece of paper? Yeah, what, one, two? Good, I'm so glad you saved it. I could just quit right now and be a happy man. How ironic, how telling, how revealing what the Spirit of God does. Does anybody notice the pyramids and the banners today? That's a mistake. Somehow, and I don't blame them at all, I think they were led by the Holy Spirit to put out the colors of the Holy Spirit today because one of the topics we're going to discuss today is the power, the working, the reliability of the Holy Spirit. If you forgot your little sheet, which I don't fault you for since we've carried them for three weeks now, you can open your hymnal to page 323. Put a marker in it. We're going to reference it in just a little bit. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. Do you know the name of everybody here within the Holy House of God today? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you've sat next to that person time after time, Sunday after Sunday, you see them, you know where they sit, they come in, and inevitably, sometime during the week, someone will come and they'll say, Pastor, I didn't see so-and-so in their pew. And I'm like, okay, well, who, who are you talking about? Well, I don't know, but they come in every Sunday and they sit over there on the pulpit side, the third pew back. You know what I'm talking about. It's the lady with, bl with uh, gray hair and she wears glasses. Okay, yeah. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. Why do people congregate in church? What is the purpose of congregating together as God's holy people? Look at Acts. Book of Acts chapter 13. Right away you're going to say what? To worship God. To say thank you God. 
Thank you for protecting us from this storm. Thank you, Lord, for watching over us and keeping us safe. Thank you, God, that the only destruction that we endured was a couple of leaves out in the yard, some small branches. You know, on my front porch at my house, got a little bench, it's got little pillows on it. Jocelyn changes them throughout the year. If it's Fourth of July, we got Fourth of July pillows. If it's Christmas, we got little Santa pillows. It's Halloween, so we've got little pumpkin pillows. And I went in the night before the storm. I'd put everything away. I'd thrown stuff in the pool. I'd tied stuff to trees. I had tightened up my fence that goes around the house. Wow, all this work, all this busyness, all these things to do. And I'm walking in, and I'm tired, and I'm exhausted. And I think to myself, you know what? I got to grab that bench and put it in the garage. I got to take those pillows, throw them somewhere in the house. So let me go sit down, and I'll get it in a minute. And you know what I did? No, I went inside. I took a shower. I told Jocelyn, Jocelyn's like, what do you want to eat? You haven't eaten all day. I said, just let me rest for a minute. I laid down on the couch, and I went to sleep. And I slept through the entire storm. And I thought to myself, what biblical analogy do we have? Christ asleep in the bow of the boat during the storm. You remember that one? Don't you care if we perish, save the disciples? And Jesus is like, you know what? I got you covered. You're okay. Nothing's bad's going to happen to you. And I am in no way saying that I am Jesus. I'm saying that that day I was exhausted. But don't we see the connection? Don't we see the parallel? The winds and the waves roared, and if you watch the news, it was heading right for Spring Hill Category 4, 150 miles an hour. Has anybody ever driven that fast? Oh, we got one in the back, yeah. 120 is as quick as I've gone, and I am not encouraging you to do that. That's fast. That's brutal. And God watched over us. God said, you know what? I got you covered. You're going to be safe. God says, I'm holding you in the palm of my hands. And so why are we gathered here today? To say thank you. To say thank you. That's part of worship. And it's not as though God is up in heaven saying, Oh, boy, nobody appreciates me. I do all this. I make the sun come up. I, I make plants to grow, and they turn into fruits and vegetables. I, I watch over people, and I give them beautiful days, and nobody ever says thank you. How unappreciative. That's not what God is doing in heaven. But our motivation to gather here today to say thank you reminds us again and again that God keeps us in the palm of our hands, that God watches over us, provides for us, nurtures us, nourishes us. That's part of worship. Another big part of worship is to congregate, to realize that we're not in this alone, that we are part of the family of faith, that we support and encourage and pray for one another. Listen to the words of Acts chapter 13. This is verses 1 to 3. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. Barnabas, we've talked about him. Simon, who was called Niger, we talked about him two weeks ago. Lucius of Cyrene. Lucius meaning light. Okay, that's literally what the word means. That's literally what the name means is light. Okay, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, notice the Holy Spirit. Okay, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. We've talked about Barnabas. Barnabas, whose name means? Thank you, son of encouragement. Son of encouragement. If you've ever heard of a Jewish young man, and he's about 12 years old, and he has his bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah. That literally means son of the covenant. 
Barnabas means son of encouragement. We talked about him. Who are you encouraging in your life? Through prayer, through example, through word and deed. Get to know God. Get to know Jesus Christ. Get into the word. Get connected to a Christian family, a congregation, a gathering of God's people. It doesn't mean we pick up a Bible and beat them over the head as much as we might like to. We gently encourage. What does Paul say in Timothy? Do it with love. Do it with love. Do it with love. A loving word. A loving word of encouragement. A loving word of wisdom. A loving word of guidance. That's how we're like Barnabas. Who else do we read about here? Simon, who or Simeon, who was called Niger. We talked about him two weeks ago. Anybody remember anything about Simeon, Simon of Niger? Simeon, that means black. He was the black man who carried the cross for Jesus up Calvary's hill. And now we see him as a principal player in the New Testament church located at Antioch. The next guy we read, Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene, Northern Africa. Okay, if we had a map here, think of this as the Mediterranean Sea, and here's Cyrene down by Egypt and, you know, kind of Libya. So in other words, he's traveled all the way around the Mediterranean Sea. He's gone through the Holy Land, Palestine, and now he's up here in Antioch, now part of the Gentile world. And what is he doing? He is the founder of the church in Antioch. How ironic and how telling. Lucius, whose name means light. He's brought the good news of the light of the world to the edge of the Gentile population, the edge, the toehold, if you will, into that area of the world you and I call Europe. How many of your ancestors come from Europe, somewhere in Europe? You can thank Lucius. Yeah, thank you, Lucius, for taking that first step so that our ancestors would hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, Lucius is a Roman name. It's an Italian name. It's a Latin name. So we know that he was a Gentile. All right? Let's keep going. Manan, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. You remember, if you read through Luke chapter 2, okay, you know, and then in those days Caesar Augustus ruled the whole Roman world. He desired what? That all the world should be taxed. All the world should be taxed. Something that you and I love to do is pay taxes. Raise your hand if you enjoy paying taxes, right? Yeah, they didn't like it any more than you and I do back in those days. And Caesar Augustus said, you know what, I want to find out how many people there are out in the world and I'm going to tax every one of them, bring all that money into my Roman coffers so that I can turn the city of Rome into a place out of wood and turn it into a place that's now built with marble. That's why he wanted to raise all of that money. And we know that Mary and Joseph, they left their hometown, they headed toward Bethlehem, right? The shepherds come and adore the baby Jesus. And then we read later on that the wise men come and they worship and adore the baby Jesus and they bring with them three gifts. What are the three gifts? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And what do we know? That these three wise men had gone to Herod the Great where is he who is born king of the Jews? Well, Herod didn't know, but he consulted his priest, and they said, in Bethlehem. And so, you know, what does Herod tell the Magi? You go, you worship, you find out where he is, and then on the way back home, you come and tell me so that I too may worship the newborn king. God warns them in a dream, do not go back to Herod because he wants to do harm to the child. So they go home another way, and what does Herod do? 
He kills all the little baby boys born in Bethlehem, two years old and under, the slaughter of the holy innocents. Now, this Herod that we read about in Acts chapter 13 was about 20 years old at this time. There's his dad on the throne, Herod the Great, murdering all these little baby boys And Herod the Tetrarch is living there in the palace about 20 years of age when this takes place. Joseph is warned in a dream to flee to Egypt because, you know, Herod and his cohorts are trying to kill the baby Jesus. And so they go, they live in Egypt for a period of time fulfilling the prophecy spoken of in the Old Testament book of Hosea out of Egypt. I have called my son. They live there in Egypt for a period of time. And then God appears to Joseph and says, okay, King Herod is dead. Those who sought the child's life, they're out of the picture now. You can return to your home homeland and so Joseph loads up the holy family again they get in their Plymouth Voyager they head back to the holy land and they settle in what part of the country Nazareth Nazareth to once again fulfill a prophecy that Jesus would be called a Nazarene and at that point in time who's running that part of the country the very same guy we read about in Acts chapter 13 Herod the Tetrarch because King Herod or King Herod Herod the Great had died and so they went to Augustus Caesar and Augustus Caesar took the Holy Land and divided it into four parts and Nazareth which is in Galilee went to Herod the Tetrarch And the little boy Jesus grows up. We read about it in the book of Matthew chapter 2. He grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. The very last thing we hear about the little boy Jesus, he's 12 years old, they had gone down to Jerusalem, he got separated from his family, they're heading back to Nazareth, they're looking around, where is Jesus, where is Jesus, where was Jesus? He was in the temple debating with the teachers of the law and they are amazed at what? His wisdom and his knowledge. And his mom, being a good Missouri Synod Lutheran, puts the guilt trip on Jesus. Don't you know that your father and I have been worried sick? We've been looking everywhere for you for three days. And Jesus says what? Didn't you know I must be about my father's business? In other words, the temple is the very first place you should have looked. Not in the markets, not in the bazaar, not out kicking a soccer ball on the field with the other little boys. You should have come to the temple first. That's where you would have found me. Then we hear nothing of Jesus until he's 30 years old. And what's the very first thing we hear about Jesus when he's 30? He goes to get baptized by his cousin in the Jordan River who is named John the Baptist. John the Baptist, he looks up on the banks of the Jordan River. He sees Jesus. He says what? Behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Now what's John's message to the people? Repent! Repent! Turn away from your sin. Turn away from your wicked ways. The axe is already at the root of the tree, says John the Baptist. One of the people that he condemned was none other than Herod the Tetrarch that we read about in Acts chapter 13. Why would John the Baptist condemn Herod the Tetrarch? Because he had married his brother's wife. His brother Philip had a wife that apparently Herod was enamored with. And so he stole her away. It's like a soap opera. Through conniving and cunning, he goes, he steals her away, and she, cha- he, she changes his name. His name is Herod. Her name now becomes Herodias. 
Herodias. That'd be like if I changed my wife's name. You're going to change your name. Her name's Jocelyn. Beautiful name, beautiful name. Beautiful name for a beautiful woman. Yeah, I expect a nice meal after church today. Yeah, but if I told her, okay, my name's Glenn, you're going to be Glenda. Which, by the way, was her mother's name. All right. Yeah. Steals her away. Herodias, who had a daughter by the name of Salome. Herod sends his troops down to the Jordan River. They capture John the Baptist. They arrest John the Baptist. They take John the Baptist. They throw him in prison. And periodically, Herod would go down to the dungeons and he would talk with John the Baptist. We have no idea what they talked about. But according to the Word of God, he liked talking to him. Finally, one night, there's this great big party. You know the story, and everybody's, you know, they're drinking the wine and having a good time. And, you know, Salome gets out, and she does her dance, and Herod is so impressed. He says, you know what? You ask for anything you want up to half of my kingdom, and I will give it to you. And rather than asking for money or jewels or power or prestige, she says what? Give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Yeah, imagine that. And Herod did not want to kill John the Baptist. He was grieved. Uh, I don't want to do this. But I've made my promise in front of all these people. How many of you have seen the movie The Greatest Story Ever Told? Wonderful movie. Fabulous movie. Do you remember who plays John the Baptist? Charlton Heston. Charlton Heston. And I can still remember watching that movie when I was a little boy and they're carrying Charlton Heston, John the Baptist, off to have his head cut off. And you know, he goes around the corner and the scene darkens and you hear John the Baptist, Charlton Heston, cry out, Repent! And you hear the axe swing through the air. Boom! The last words of John the Baptist are the first words of John the Baptist. Repent. Turn away from your sin. That one last clarion call to get back on that narrow path to God. Why do I mention all of this? Because according to Acts chapter 13, Manaean was like a brother to Herod the Tetrarch. They were boon companions. They were bosom buddies. And they were like that from when they were little children. They were lifelong friends. And so is it possible that when Herod the Great ordered the slaughter of the Holy Innocents with Herod the Tetrarch being about 20 years old at the time, Manaean would have been there to see and witness that horrific event? Is it possible that when John the Baptist was condemning Herod the Tetrarch for stealing away his brother's wife, that Manaean too was there to hear the sermons of John the Baptist that he preached from the dungeons of that prison? Is it possible that when Pilate sent Jesus to Herod, Herod the Tetrarch, that Manaean was there. You'll remember when Jesus stood before Herod. You know, first he went to Pilate. Then Pilate found out he was a Galilean. Ah, hey, you're Herod's problem. Sent him over to Herod. And Herod did what he questioned him. And the Bible tells us that Herod wanted to see Jesus because of what? First and foremost, he thought it was John the Baptist raised from the dead. Hey, I'm hearing about this guy named Jesus and he's doing all these fabulous miracles and people are following him, crowds and crowds and crowds of people and he's got a message. for the, Is it possible that the guy that I cut his head off, that somehow his head has been reattached to his body and he's now going around preaching and teaching and doing all these miracles? I want to talk to this man. Maybe he'll do a miracle for me. 
Maybe he'll walk across the water of my pool. Maybe if I fill a couple of barrels filled with water, he'll turn them into wine. Maybe I can give him a little tiny piece of bread and he'll, he'll feed my entire palace court. I want to see this man. I want to talk to this man. I want to find out what this man is all about. Could it be that he's gathered this army of people together? He's going to overthrow me. He's going to execute me, drive me out. I'll go into exile. And he will now rule Galilee rather than me. Is this some kind of civil war, uprising, un unrest, some kind of a coup? And so they bring Jesus to Herod. And Herod asks him all manner of questions to which Jesus does not answer a word. Is it possible that Menaean was there and saw Jesus face to face? Is it possible that Menaean, this, this brother by another mother, was there to witness and see the Son of God who does not answer Herod a word. Is it possible that after Jesus was escorted away back to the back before Pilate that Menaean said, yeah, I'm going to check this guy out. How many, well, I won't ask you, don't raise your hand, but if you've ever been to court, what do you do? You're standing there before the judge, and you argue your case. This isn't my fault. I'm not guilty. You don't understand what happened. Wait a minute. I've got a reason I did this thing. You defend yourself. Jesus didn't say a word. Could that silence have spoken volumes to the man named Menaean? So much so that when Jesus was escorted back to Pilate, you know, I gotta, I gotta watch this. I gotta figure this thing out. I'm gonna go check and see what does he do in front of Pilate? What's gonna happen to this guy? Is it possible that Menaean went all the way back to Pilate, saw, observed, saw Pilate wash his hands, saw Jesus shoulder that cross, saw Simon of Cyrene help Jesus, saw Jesus nailed to the cross, saw Jesus witnessing his suffering, his anguish, his pain, and yet saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Could it be that Menaean saw the the very thing you and I long to see. The suffering and death of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. And could it be that's the reason he's mentioned in Acts chapter 13 as a principal player in the New Testament church. He saw, he was there, he heard, he witnessed the empty tomb, the stone rolled away, the angelic announcement, he is not here, he has risen just as he said he would. Is it possible that Menaean went back to his brother by another mother, Herod, Herod the Tatron. Hey man, I got something to tell you. This guy is who he says he is. His kingdom is not of this world. He's the Savior. He's the Messiah. He's the one we've waited for ever since the world was made. Notice what they do. These notable individuals who are the principal people of the New Testament church in Antioch, they gather together and they pray. What does that remind us of? Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into his harvest field. Who is the Lord of the harvest? 
It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. I'm convinced. For years and years and years. I've been a pastor over 30 years now. And oh, well, Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. I mean, isn't that what we sing? You know, hark the voice of Jesus calling who will go and work today. Fields are white and harvest waiting, who will bear the sheaves away? Loud and long the master calleth, rich reward he offers free. Who will answer gladly, saying, Here am I, send me, send me. Yeah, and I said I wouldn't sing today. But the more I studied, the more I researched, the more I thought, the more I pondered and meditated, I am convinced that the Lord of the harvest is the Holy Spirit, and here's why. Read it. Read it. That's the third article, the meaning to the third article of the Apostles' Creed. Let's read it together. If you don't have your sheet, turn to page 323. Okay, we go down to the meaning. I believe. Let's read it together. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth, and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. Okay, let's stop right there. Whose responsibility is it to convert? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul says in Corinthians, and nobody can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Everybody say it right now. Jesus is Lord. Jesus. Say it again like you mean it. Jesus is Lord. That's the working of the Holy Spirit in your life right now. Notice what these men did. They congregated together as God's family. They worshiped and they prayed. They knew each other by name. And they prayed to the Lord of the harvest, the Holy Spirit, do your job. Send people out into the world to do what? Not to convert, but to speak, to share, to witness. I've lost count of the number of times I've said it. It is not your responsibility to convert people to Jesus Christ. It is not your responsibility to prove to people that Jesus Christ is the Savior and Lord of the world. That is the responsibility of the Holy Spirit. Okay, read Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Read it today. Your responsibility is to share the good news. To speak to other people in word and deed what Christ has done for you. And then leave the conversion to the Holy Spirit. What time is it? Oh, wow, boy, he wouldn't shut up today. I had a lot of time to think when the wind was blowing, okay? Yeah. Friends and fellow Christians and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and our minds in the one true faith unto Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.